Hello, I'm Dr. Ward Dean, Medical Director for Vitamin Research Products. The first international anti-aging conference, which was sponsored jointly by Vitamin Research and International Anti-Aging Systems, was held on June 17th and 18th, 2000, in Monte Carlo, Monaco. The conference attracted scientists, clinicians, and anti-aging enthusiasts from around the world. These tapes offer an opportunity to listen to the wealth of information that was presented. For those who were unable to attend the conference, it offers a hint of the experience that they missed. Please join me as I listen to one of the speakers at this breakthrough conference. I cordially invite you to join us at the next conference in Monaco next year, which promises to offer a similar roster of international specialists in anti-aging medicine. Our next speaker, has a long medical career that began in anesthesiology and pain management. He is a founding board member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and a member of many others, including the Gerontological Society of America and the American College of Nutrition. He is also the president and medical director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Foundation. His last book, Brain Longevity, and his soon-to-be-released book, Meditation as Medicine, are major milestones. Please welcome Dr. Dharma Singh. Thank you. Now, I'd like to thank everyone who's been thanked already. I'm always asked two questions. The first question is, why do you look like this? And the second question is, do you really think, are you serious when you say that you can help people prevent and reverse memory loss and actually impact Alzheimer's disease? So I'm going to tell you about both of those things. The answer to the second one is absolutely. Now, as, as Phil was mentioning, I have a very strong Western medical background. I'm an anesthesiologist. I was chief resident at the University of California, San Francisco, oh, too many years ago to think about. And when I was there, I did some very interesting research. One was the best anesthetic for heart disease, a particular operation where we did for Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, if you remember that conduction defect, and we found it was the anesthetic that reduced stress. I also was involved in obstetrical anesthesia, and I was part of the research team that found out that epidural anesthesia for cesarean section was the best technique as measured by endorphins. So I have a very strong Western medical background. I also became a practicing clinical anesthesiologist for about 15 years. In addition, I was involved in pain management. But I also have an alternative bent, as you might say. I studied mind-body medicine at Harvard, basic and advanced training, and took the medical acupuncture for physicians training program at UCLA School of Medicine. I also have a nice alternative background. But I think the most influential part of my background as far as alternative medicine was the fact that I studied with a master from 1978 to 1981, and I'm still studying with him today, a man named Yogi Bhajan, who's a master of Kundalini and White Tantric Yoga and Eastern Healing Philosophy. And I got so involved in that teaching and became so interested in that lifestyle, which is basically revolving around yoga, meditation, natural living, and helping other people, that I decided to follow his example and go into it in such depth that I totally changed my lifestyle, changed my name, put on a turban because he's a Sikh from northern India and I'm what's known as a Western Sikh or an American Sikh. So that's why I look like this. And the interesting thing is by combining this Western knowledge with this Eastern knowledge, it has allowed me to create this brain longevity program which has helped people prevent and reverse memory loss and even impact Alzheimer's disease. So you might ask, why do I say something like this? Why am I saying that an integrative program, which combines just about everything we've heard about this morning, plus other things, can really work? And the answer is very simple, but it's revolutionary. And that is the brain is flesh and blood like the rest of the body. Now, I know we're all medical people here, and that may sound too simple for you. You want a very complex uh, example or information, but it's very simple. The brain is an organ. The brain is not a piece of wood or a computer on the upper story. Your brain is like your heart. In fact, in Brain Longevity, my book, I talk about what works for the heart actually works for the head with some modification. So remember that. What works for the heart works for the head, and the brain is flesh and blood like the rest of the body. 
So because the brain is flesh and blood like the rest of the body, the idea that any one drug, like our conventional medical colleagues want to use for Alzheimer's disease, like your Aricept or your Exelon, or even the combination of drugs, the idea that one idea is ever going to help people prevent or reverse memory loss and reverse Alzheimer's disease is wrong. It's just not going to happen because you see the brain is an organ and it's a complex organ. For example, to really impact the brain, we have to attack it, if you will, from a number of different areas. Of course, we have to work on the neurotransmitters. But there's more to neurotransmitters than just acetylcholine, which is what a drug like Aricept, the cholinesterase inhibitor, does. We have to get the dopamine receptors activated. And something like Depranil is very good for that, but also the exercises that we just did are very good for that. We have to work on the cell membrane of the neuron. We have to go inside the brain and work on the nucleus. There's a lot of talk about genetic manipulation and things like that. I think the greatest thing to maintain genetic integrity are simple exercises that we can do ourselves. In fact, 90% of my program in some patients, 75 to 90% of the program are things that people can do for themselves. The other 10% comes from outside of yourself, like drugs or nutrients or things like that. But most of the things that you can do to activate your highest level of brain power come from inside yourself. There are things that you can do. So we have to work on the nucleus. We have to, of course, work on the mitochondrial level, as we've heard. We have to approach the microtubules. Many, this is the nutrient part of the brain cell. We have to, of course, scavenge free radicals. There's no doubt about that. Free radicals are an important part of brain aging. But we have to get it from every angle. And of course, the brain being a flesh and blood organ, we must make sure that we get adequate blood flow, adequate oxygen, and adequate glucose in the bloodstream going to the brain. What good is it if you have all the nutrients in the world in your bloodstream and it doesn't get to your brain? So we have to make sure that we're approaching the brain on a holistic, if you will, level, that we're covering all the bases. So I'd like to talk to you about the basis of the Brain Longevity Program. And these make up the four pillars of brain longevity. And the first pillar is nutrition and supplementation. The second, of course, as you can see, stress management, the third exercise, and the fourth, anti-aging drugs and hormones. In our brain longevity program, we use a master's degree nutritionist who works with every single patient to provide a 15 to 20 percent fat diet based on their preferences. Now, how many people here are familiar with, for example, the Atkins diet or a high-protein diet? Please raise your hand. Okay. Of those who raise your hand, is this a good diet, do you think? Raise your hand if you think it's a good diet. Okay, a couple of people think it's, four people think it's a good diet. I don't think it's that bad, of course. I think for the long term, too much fat is not good. On the other hand, you have the Ornish diet, for example, for heart disease, which is a very, very, very low fat diet, less than 10% and less, which I think is too restrictive. In our program, we like to emphasize protein because exercise is a critical part of our protein. So we're up to about 20% fat, and then let's say 50% protein, 30% carbohydrate when possible. That's difficult, especially when you're working with someone based on their preferences. So it usually ends up 40, 40, 20, although I'd like it 50, 30, 20. I think a lot of people are too sensitive to carbohydrates, especially complex carbohydrates, and they tend to get like a balloon. So we have to be careful with the diet, but the most important thing, as you'll see in a moment, is the concept of a low-fat diet, 15 to 20 percent for the brain, and we'll see why. Brain-specific nutrients we're going to hear about in a moment. Stress management is crucial. In fact, if you were going to ask me what's the most important part of the program, I believe it's stress management. And as we go on through the next 50 minutes or so, you'll see why. Exercise, also important. We said we have to get blood to the brain, but there's more than physical exercise, as we'll see. Cognitive exercise is critically important. I believe that nowhere more so than in, that, in the brain is that old adage, use it or lose it, more important. We have to keep our mind active. And you might say to me, well, I'm a doctor. I'm using my brain eight hours a day, 10 hours a day. Isn't that enough? No, it's not because we're not just talking about the part of your brain that you use for work, we're talking about activating your whole brain. So for example, if you're a left brain person in a left brain job, you might want to take up art or music or something like that in your off time to activate all parts of your brain. And we'll see more about that in a moment. And finally, I think this, since this is a medical program, there is a very good reason and a strong presence in the program for certain anti-aging drugs 
and hormone replacement therapy. Uh, I'm very big on hormone replacement therapy when taken in its place in small amounts. So that basically makes up the four pillars of the Brain Longevity Program, and I'd like to talk to you about each one of those in a little more detail. Let's talk about nutrition. This is a very interesting study. This was done by Dr. William Grant, who's an astrophysicist with NASA. He's a PhD, he's not a medical person and not a clinician. But Dr. Grant's mother came down with Alzheimer's disease, and he thought, let me see what I can do to help people so they don't have to go through the pain that our family has gone through. He's also a genius on the computer, so he went through the World Health Organization literature, and he found out something very, very important about dietary links to all chronic diseases, but including Alzheimer's disease. And what he found was that the amount of fat in the diet, as well as the amount of calories in the diet, is consistent with the incidence of Alzheimer's disease as well as the prevalence. Now we see that the United States of America, good old USA, we have the highest fat in the diet, the highest amount of calories in the diet, and the highest incidence of coronary artery disease, arthritis, and Alzheimer's disease. But we see something very interesting in the study, and that's Finland is moderately afflicted with Alzheimer's disease, but as you may know, they have a very high amount of fat in the diet. So what is protective about their diet? Fish, or omega-3 fatty acids, the so-called good fats, actually protect the brain. Now, let's look over here at Japan, Nigeria, and things like that. If you see Japan, Singapore, and China, these are the, your oriental countries. Of course, they naturally eat a low-fat diet. We all know that. Why is Nigeria in there then? What do they do? Well, they have a lot of grains. Their diet is grain-based, which seems to be protective. It's also low-fat. But the interesting thing is if you take someone from Japan and put them in the United States and they follow the American lifestyle, they develop Alzheimer's disease at the same rate as someone in the United States eating the American diet. Same with the Nigerian. These studies have been done. They've taken Japanese people who have moved to American cities such as Indianapolis, and the same with Nigerians, and they've seen that when you take a person out of their natural habitat, so to speak, and put them in the United States where they're eating a different diet and living that stressful lifestyle, they do develop Alzheimer's disease at the same rate as the Americans do. So this is a very important finding. I'd just like to add as an aside, when Dr. Grant presented this literature, the esteemed Alzheimer's Association was very negative towards it. Now, I don't know exactly why that is, and I've often wondered if there was a coordinated system that they're trying to suppress some of the information or they're just a lack of awareness. I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. But it is true that a lot of times when some of this very good information comes out, it is poo-pooed or suppressed by some of our conventional medical colleagues. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about brain-specific nutrients. These are the ones that I use. You're, you've heard a lot of nutrients presented and you'll hear more. I can only tell you what I found to be effective in my program and I use it based on it's preventive, it's regenerative, and I can't use everything. I mean I've had patients come in to see me who've carried literally a shopping bag full of nutrients. You've probably seen that too. Everybody means well but you have people taking the right thing at the wrong time, the wrong thing at the right time, and just a whole mess taking things and also cost is involved. So this is what I've developed. This is how I use brain-specific nutrients. And you'll see that some are missing, and I'll mention why one of them is missing. Vitamin E, of course, is a wonderful antioxidant. But beyond that, when it comes to medical studies and clinical research, we see that this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, by Leon J. Thal from San Diego and Mary J. Sano from Columbia, that in patients with moderate Alzheimer's disease, getting 2,000 international units of alpha tocopherol, a synthetic alpha tocopherol, they were able to slow the progression of mid-stage Alzheimer's disease compared to the control group. And the way they measured that was they had an endpoint, and that was admitting the patient into an institution for institutional care. And the patients given vitamin E were uh, slowed by seven months. Interestingly enough, they also used Depernil, and they showed it was equal to vitamin E, and for some strange reason that I don't understand, I think this is a flawed part of the study, when they combined vitamin E and Depernil, even though logic tells us it would be synergistic, they found that they were equal, more or less. 
I don't understand that part of the study, but the point I'm trying to make here is that vitamin E is a very critical brain regenerative or protective rather, it's a protective nutrient. And I think that people should be on vitamin E. In my program, I use approximately 800 international units. If someone has Alzheimer's disease, I'll get up to 2,000 international units. Coenzyme Q10 has just been discussed. Uh, my experience with coenzyme Q10 uh, goes back to discussions with Dr. Flint Beal from Harvard, a neurology department, at a wonderful medical meeting held right down the road in Nice, France, about 1996. Uh, when the information on CoQ10 in the brain was just coming out and he presented his work in a lecture series uh, where everyone else was presenting about drugs. And after each person presented their drug research, they got a nice round of applause. But when he presented his work on coenzyme Q10, it was polite at the best. Uh, the people in the conventional medical community did not want to hear about it at that time. Afterwards, I went up to Dr. Beale and I said, Dr. Beale, are you saying that human beings should be taking coenzyme Q10. And he said, Dharma, they should put it in the drinking water. That's how powerful it is. It activates the mitochondria. It's a very good free radical scavenger. It's an excellent compound. Again, we've heard about the dose. I like to get up to 100 milligrams. The ideal dose is 3 milligrams per kilogram. But if you're getting up to 300 milligrams, that's very expensive. So I think 100 milligrams is good. If you get down much below that, towards 60 milligrams, something like that. It's really not doing that much. Below 60 milligrams, I wouldn't even bother with it. If you're not going to take really 100, I mean, 100 is the ideal amount So for, for us and our patients. Uh, so that's what I recommend. That's what I use myself. Ginkgo, I mean, what can we say about ginkgo? Here in Europe, there have been at least 400 studies at last count uh, showing the positive benefits of ginkgo. In the United States, how many studies do you think have been done on ginkgo? One. Now, the, this is really interesting. I just went to another international aging conference on rural aging in, in Charlotte, uh, West Virginia, sponsored by the United Nations. And I went to the Alzheimer's workshop where a pharmacologist was giving a lecture on drugs and he was talking about ginkgo. And of course, he was kind of putting it under the carpet and said, well, the study was flawed. The study that was published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, was flawed. It was a terrible study. People dropped out. And so I don't use it. I don't think there's any worth to it or anything like that. And I raised my hand and said, excuse me, but wasn't it true that in that flawed study that the results of ginkgo came out better than Aricept, 27 to 26? And he had to admit that's true. The ginkgo study, as flawed as it was, showed it is a better compound to use in a patient with dementia than Aricept. Now, Exelon is another drug that's coming out. It's, uh, it's actually better than Aricept, but you can see that ginkgo is a very worthwhile compound. Uh, it's being repeated. The studies are being repeated at the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Vermont, funded by the National Institutes of Health of the United States. The key in using ginkgo, in my opinion, is the dose. Many people just use 90 to 120 milligrams, but if you have a problem, you want to get up to 220 milligrams, 240 milligrams a day. That is a real good dose. Now, there is a potential problem, and this is controversial. That is, when a patient is on ginkgo and vitamin E and perhaps an anticoagulant or aspirin, is there really a concern about bleeding? How many people have heard this now about vitamin E and ginkgo? All right, this is something that's come out again. I think this is a, frankly, my belief, but I could be wrong, I don't know. I think there's a misinformation campaign, being, and I'm not paranoid and I'm not a conspiracy theory type of person, but I think there is a misinformation campaign being promulgated by somebody in the higher echelons of medicine because they've come out and talked about the bleeding diathesis caused by vitamin E and ginkgo. In fact, I've had patients, it's been on, in the news, and I've had patients who've gone for surgery. For example, I had one patient who was on good vitamin E and ginkgo doses, and he had bilateral carpal tunnels. He went for the first one, no problem. Went home, came back. Anesthesiologist had heard it on the news, canceled the case. Said, you have to go home, get off vitamin E and ginkgo. So I said, well, why don't you just do that? That's okay, stop it for four days, five days, go back, get the operation. He did that, you know, of course, it went fine. But I've even had cardiologists tell their patients, I put a world-famous producer on an excellent program, I was real proud of myself. He went back to LA, went to his cardiologist, cardiologist said, stop the program. You're on Coumadin, this is vitamin E and ginkgo, you're gonna bleed to death. Well, let me tell you, there are people right now walking around anticoagulated to the max, so if they get in a car accident, they're dead. 
So what's the difference? All you have to do is measure it, and then you can reduce the Coumadin, you can reduce the vitamin E, you can reduce the Ginkgo, but you, there, this is the art of medicine. You don't just automatically stop a dose of vitamin E and Ginkgo because you've heard something on the news. I did a little bit of a Medline research. I found there was one case reported of bleeding, just one case, and yet this is now being disseminated throughout the news media about the danger of vitamin E and ginkgo. So I don't accept that. I think that vitamin E and ginkgo are really safe, but as long as you know that, you can watch out for it and you can measure some of the bleeding parameters. Phosphatidylserine, I think, is another misused drug or underutilized compound. Now, back in the late 80s and early 90s, Thomas Crook, who was then at the NIH, did a number of wonderful studies with phosphatidylserine at uh, Stanford University at Vanderbilt and down the road here in the Italian Alzheimer's centers, which are very advanced. And he found out that phosphatidylserine was very effective both in age-associated memory impairment and in Alzheimer's disease. The problem was that this phosphatidylserine came from bovine brains. And of course, with the mad cow scare, they had to stop that, it fell into disrepute. So phosphatidylserine virtually became unusable for about four or five or six years. Then two companies learned how to synthesize phosphatidylserine from soybeans, and many studies have been repeated, and they found to be effective. So again, but this is another misinformation or non-information situation where this is not even being mentioned by Alzheimer's researchers or doctors, and the reason is, I don't know. But phosphatidylserine is an excellent compound of doing all the things that we've heard about, including uh, helping prevent the wear and tear on the cell membrane, like the bottom of your tire wears out, the cell membrane and the neuron wears out, and phosphatidylserine helps with that. It allows nutrients to flow and neurotransmitters to communicate. So phosphatidylserine, the dose I like to use is, if a person really has a serious problem, 300 milligrams, but if not, 100 milligrams. shouldn't take less than 100 and the studies haven't shown any benefit to taking over 300 milligrams of phosphatidylserine. Finally, we see DHA, that's not DHEA, that's DHA dococohexanoic acid, which is a fish oil, another omega-3 that can come from salmon, but also is found in algae. And the effect of DHA is it provides a laser-like focus or concentration. In fact, there are many people uh, in, in the medical community and and people in, who go to health food stores who use what are called green drinks. And these green drinks are rich in the omega-3 DHAs uh, from spirulina, chlorella, blue-green algae, and things like that. These are very good compounds. They provide micronutrients to the brain. And with our soil depleted and the poor diets that many people eat, they don't get those micronutrients. So that's very important. So these are the nutrients that I use in my program. So you might say, well, why don't you use acetyl L-carnitine? We heard it's good. It is good. But the studies that I'm aware of show that it has a targeted population. That's the person about 60 years old who has early onset Alzheimer's disease. It's really, unless you're taking it for the stimulating qualities, the stimulating effects, and I don't use compounds in my program for their stimulation effect. I think that gives a false sense of brain function. I like protection and regeneration. Unless you're using acetyl L-carnitine for the stimulating properties, in my opinion, then it just should be for that one population. Besides, remember, cost is an issue, and now we're starting to add up so many things that cost can go overboard, so I like to just limit it to these two. There are two other comp these five. There are two other compounds, though, that I'll be using, I think, more and more. One is huprazine A from Chinese cub moss which uh, has been studied and shown to have the same effect as Aricepts and anticholinesterase. So I like that compound, and I think that's going to become very useful. The other is venpocetine, which does increase cerebral metabolism like a paracetam. I found that the doses that are being recommended are too high. If you get the dose down to about 2.5 milligrams, I think you'll see a, a little better of an effect on that. So these are basically the brain-specific nutrients that I utilize in the program. I just want to show you that there is literature support, clinical medicine support to use nutrients. And I'm just showing you one. We could show you a number of them. But this was in the journal Alzheimer's Disease and Associated Illnesses, the most prestigious Alzheimer's disease journal. It was edited by Peter J. Whitehouse, professor 
of neurology at Case Western Reserve University and an icon in Alzheimer's disease research. And you see that vitamin E and vitamin C supplementation decrease the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So the words Alzheimer's and prevention can go together. See, a lot of people say, well, you can't use those two words together, especially people from the Alzheimer's Association. You cannot use the word Alzheimer's and prevention together. But here we see that even in the conventional medical literature, you can use Alzheimer's and prevention together. It is possible, in my opinion, to prevent Alzheimer's disease, to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, Zavin Kachaturian, the president of the Nancy and Ronald Reagan Foundation for Research in Alzheimer's Disease, has said that because of the aging of the population, if we can slow the progression of cognitive decline by five years, decrease the incidence of Alzheimer's disease from happening by five years, we can cut the rate in half. And if we can decrease this Alzheimer's disease incidence by 10 years, we can eliminate the disease. Well, I think it's possible to do that. And I think this information shows that it's possible. This is just a slide to go over coenzyme Q10. We see, like everything else, it goes down with age in the brain. So it's very useful to take it. Phosphatidylserine has been shown to reverse signs and symptoms of memory loss by 12 years. And here are some of the problems that patients report, and many people who don't have a serious cognitive decline report as they get older. For example, inability to remember names on introduction, uh, losing things, getting lost, not able to find their way to places that uh, they've been able to find their way to before. Uh, losing things around the house and things like that. Telephone numbers are very important. And all those things that, are, that imply attention, concentration, and short-term memory. Phosphatidylserine has been clinically proven to be able to affect that. We've seen this slide before, and we've seen the many slides that show that all the hormones go down with age. I'm not denying that. In fact, I measure DHEA and IGF-1 and thyroid and testosterone and all those hormones in every single patient. And I've never, well, that's not true. I've had only one patient in all the time, the seven years I've been doing this exclusively, who's had a normal DHEA level. All the other ones are even below normal, they're bottom. So I think that DHEA is a critical hormone for maintaining cognitive function as we age. And I measure every one's and I replace it. I start with about 50 milligrams in a man, 25 milligrams in a woman, of the micronized sustained release. It's really important to use a sustained release because you don't want just a spike and then a decrease. You want, it to maintain, you want to maintain that level throughout the whole day. There are receptors for DHEA right in the brain, just like estrogen, just like testosterone for that matter. So I think DHEA is a very important hormone in brain longevity been a lot of clinical studies lately on DHA that show that it enhances mood, improves energy level, and the word that's usually used to describe the feeling with taking DHA is ebullient, makes someone feel bouncy, makes them feel good, makes them feel youthful. Just to cover all the bases, physical exercise has been shown in a study by Robert Friedland, again from Case Western, in a retrospective analysis, people who exercise on a regular basis from age 40 to age 60, developed Alzheimer's disease markedly less than those who did not. Another preventive idea. Regular physical exercise increases blood flow, it increases growth factors in the brain, and it also increases those feel-good chemicals like endorphins, which uh, combat depression, which is a risk factor for developing cognitive decline. Beyond that, cognitive exercise has actually been shown to regenerate brain cells. Brain cells can be regenerated. It's very difficult, but it can be done. And if nothing else, they increase the connections, the sprouting between neurons. So they increase communication. The best thing is to exercise and use cognitive exercise at the same time, to combine physical and cognitive exercise. For example, you can ride an exercise bike and read the newspaper or watch TV if that's cognitive exercise, or do a crossword puzzle, or read a book and then discuss the book with someone. And in our program, we use what's called headline discussion, where we take a newspaper, a simple newspaper, for example, the USA Today, and we have them read the column, the column on the side and the main point on the top, 
and then we have them underlined. There's usually about three main points in the column and then the headline, and we have the person then with their caregiver discuss that. And sometimes it takes 30 minutes for them to defrost their neurons, but we find that people can actually regenerate their memory uh, by doing headline discussion exercises. Now, the brain will only last about 40 minutes if someone's got cognitive decline, then it'll wear out, they'll get fatigued. But we ask them to do this about 30 minutes four times a week in the evening, because most people just space out in the evening or watch TV or things like that. We ask them to do cognitive exercise in the evening. And we found it to be very helpful. If you want to do the best thing for your brain, uh, besides something that I'm going to talk about in a moment, you can combine physical exercise and cognitive exercise. Now we're going to talk about something that's very important, and that is something that we've heard a little bit about here this morning. But I think this is the most critical factor facing us as we're in and moving forward in the 21st century. I don't think there's anyone who would deny that there is an acceleration of lifestyle, acceleration of stress. Some people call it multitasking, doing so many different things at once, time stacking, having a lot of different responsibilities, whether it's the combination of aging parents and younger children and our own personal life. Technology, which has really been developed to aid us, many times has produced more stress. In fact, there are studies now that show that for every one hour spent in the blue hue of the internet, there is an increase in 1% of depression. I remember when I first started practicing anesthesia, I was the only one who had a beeper. I mean, no one else had a beeper. The beeper went off in a movie, I knew it was me because I was a doctor. Now everybody has a beeper. You see people with two beepers, two cell phones, and a fax machine strung over their shoulder. And this guy is a real estate agent. So you see that acceleration, I don't think our brain has really evolved to the point where we can really handle all this input. People go crazy from it. I was walking through the airport the other day and I saw a woman with two cell phones. I think she was schizophrenic because she was talking to herself. She said, hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? <laughs> but I think this is honestly and seriously a very big problem and it is supported by the medical literature, the god of neuroscientists, Robert Sapolsky. And I'm gonna take you through a little chronological review of the literature on stress and cognitive function. And in aging, we see that Robert Sapolsky showed that stress is an accelerator of, of aging, normal aging, and we saw this from Dr. Dean's presentation. We don't need to dwell on it, but we're gonna go now to specify and be specific about the brain. Again, Sapolsky and McEwen showed that when we're on, the key word here, ladies and gentlemen, is unbalanced. It's not just stress, it's unbalanced stress. When we don't take time out for ourselves to balance our stress, it becomes unbalanced, we release excessive amount of cortisol from the adrenal gland. This goes to the floods, the hippocampus of the brain, the memory center. It has an effect like battery acid on the memory center and turns your brain into a toxic dump. That is what literally happens. So we see that there must be ways to lower cortisol. We have to do that in order to maintain a high level of cognitive function throughout our life. I want to take you through some very, very powerful studies. This one was done by one of my heroes, Sonia Lupian at McGill University, where she studied a number of elderly, over 65, not that elderly, people for a first study was four years. There was no intervention. She found they broke off into three groups. First group, their cortisol levels went up. Second stayed the same. Third went down. The group that had their cortisol levels go up had explicit memory loss, the inability to voluntarily recall previously learned information. This is explicit memory loss. It's the kind we saw with phosphatidylserine, that phosphatidylserine helps. It's the memory loss that many people complain of. If their cortisol levels stayed the same, their testing stayed the same, if their cortisol levels went down, they had a reusing effect on their cognitive testing. Well, she followed the study up four years later, and when I talked to Sonia, she was very upset. The study had just come out, and she said she had become very, very closely attached to these people. She became friends with them. She got to know them. And unfortunately, those whose levels of cortisol stayed up, now eight years, developed Alzheimer's disease. They went from explicit memory loss to what's known as early memory impairment, on to develop the real thing. 
Alzheimer's disease. There was no intervention. They just watched the people decline as cortisol levels went up. And it's the amount of cortisol that floods your brain over the length of your lifetime. If you're stressed today, it doesn't mean anything. It's the amount of chronic unbalanced stress that you have over your lifetime. That's why what I'm going to be talking to you about in a moment is so important. Well, Dr. Newcomer at Washington University in St. Louis said, let me take a look at this. And he took normal young volunteers, college age students, and injected them with stress doses of cortisol and produced the same problem. He narrowed it down to show that cortisol from unbalanced stress is clearly a brain aging. Even if it's acutely done, it can age your brain, it can decrease your cognitive function. Cortisol, by the way, blocks the uptake of glucose. That's one of the things it does, and we saw that glucose is very important. Cortisol also disrupts neurological function by impeding proper neurotransmitter communication. And we've seen that there's brain cell death. Cortisol can actually cause brain cell death. First it causes swelling, and then atrophy, and then brain cell death. This is how it does it. This is glutamate, by the way. But we see that when there's cortisol there, the uptake of glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid, is blocked from going into the glial cells. That allows excess cortisol to be in the synaptic cleft. When excess cortisol is in the synaptic cleft, this allows glutamate to stimulate the NMDA receptor and allows the influx of extracellular calcium into the cell itself. And this has nothing to do with dietary calcium. This is uh, extracellular calcium then going intracellular. This causes free radical damage, inflammation, and swelling of the brain cell. This is what cortisol does on a microscopic or an electron microscopic level. It allows the influx, the, the rush through the channels of calcium, which is very deleterious to the neuronal function. Now, you've seen this slide before. This is from the work of Dillman and Dean. But uh, once again, we can just uh, look at this and see that as we get older, our sensitivity to cortisol increases. So as we get older, it is even more important to do some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, to take care of our brain. We must take care of our brain. Otherwise, your brain won't take care of you. Now, I'd like to talk to you about one of the chief ways to take care of your brain. This is a slide that is from 1948, and it was from a Swiss physiologist named Walter Hess, Dr. Walter Hess, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1948 in physiology for showing that there's something very unique about the hypothalamus besides what we've already heard. What Dr. Hess did was he took electrodes and put them into the hypothalamus of a cat. This is a cat. This is not a human skull. And he stimulated the electrode, and he produced in the cat the so-called stress response, the fight or flight response. The animal got up on its hinds. Its eyes dilated. It made the noise of a cat. Its hair went up, showed its fangs. It got really upset. It got stressed. Interestingly enough, what he did next was he moved the probe. And lo and behold, he produced in the hypothalamus by stimulating it the exact opposite response to the stress response. He called this the trophotrophic response. He called the stress response the ergotrophic response. The ergotrophic and the trophotrophic response, proving that just by, if you find a way to touch the hypothalamus, you can produce a naturally occurring event. You can elicit a naturally occurring event that is the opposite of the stress response. It took about 25 years of research until the great Dr. Herbert Benson at Harvard, who I've studied with, named this response that is the opposite of the stress response the relaxation response. And he showed in human beings that there is a simple way to produce the physiological entity. This is not a technique. There are a number of techniques that produce the same physiological endpoint. I want to repeat that. It's very important. 
there are a number of physiological, a number of techniques that produce the same physiological endpoint. So we see that it's a natural phenomenon. We see that it's well studied, and we'll see in a moment that it's simple, and we'll see also that it can be specific. So when he stimulated the hypothalamus now in humans by showing them a specific technique, one technique of many, to produce the physiological endpoint known as the relaxation response, they found that first and foremost it reduced the sympathetic nervous system response. All these stress hormones went down and the nervous system didn't react so strongly to the next stress. Blood pressure went down, pulse went down, respiratory rate went down, the demand for the body of oxygen went down and became known as a wakeful hypometabolic state. A wakeful hypometabolic state. The person was relaxed yet alert. There are a number of studies I could show you. I'm just going to pick one that I think is important to the brain because as we know hypertension is associated with strokes but hypertension and heart disease, coronary artery disease are directly related to the development of Alzheimer's disease as well and that's exclusive of multi-infarct dementia. So the Relaxation response was shown to reduce the incidence or the blood pressure in a, if a person was taking blood pressure medication, they lowered the blood pressure medication. Sometimes they could eliminate blood pressure medication. It's also important for us as physicians to realize that there are things that we can do for our own health. This was a study done in a large corporation, AT&T, where they taught them the relaxation response, and I'd like to just share this with you so you can benefit from this, not just your patients can benefit, but that you can benefit. It's been shown that, for example, if you have a break in the afternoon, before you have the coffee in the coffee break, if you spent five minutes going over the relaxation response, if you elicited the so-called relaxation response, in the end, it shows that self-reported measures of health, performance, and well-being were optimized. So there are many many physiological benefits to doing the relaxation response, sometimes also called meditation. There are a number of different ways to get into the same physiological endpoint. The key point to know is that every study that's ever looked at it has shown that meditation or the regular elicitation of the relaxation response lowers cortisol and keeps it down. That is to say, if you were to elicit the response in the morning when cortisol levels are the highest, especially people who wake up with what's called morning anxiety, this is what leads to coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, and Alzheimer's disease, morning anxiety with high cortisol levels. We see that by eliciting the relaxation response or by learning to meditate, you lower cortisol and it stays down for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. But it's important to realize that because it is something that needs to be done on a regular basis. That's why it's called the regular elicitation of the relaxation response. Now here's another way of getting to the same technique and what we're at the same physiological endpoint rather. And what we're seeing now is we're going up in levels of sophistication of eliciting the response. This is transcendental meditation literature. I have no connection with transcendental meditation. I'm just showing you this because they've been very well funded and they've done some outstanding research and I want to show you this. Transcendental meditation has shown to be essentially anti-aging and anti-disease. You can see that people who practice the TM technique as it's called over the length of time of the study had markedly decreased incidence of all disease every disease was decreased through the practice of meditation. If there was a drug like this that came out, it would be more popular than the combination of Prozac and Viagra. This is a real, real entity. Moving on with TM, it was shown that the aging process can be reversed and slowed by the TM technique. The aging process in this case was blood pressure, visual acuity, hearing, and rapid response to cognitive stimulation, pressing a button. But they also showed that long term, if the longer a person does meditation, the greater the effects of it are. Here's a very interesting study that was done at Harvard where they went to nursing homes. Because in this study, 
the subjects of the meditation at the end of the three-year study period, 100% of the nursing home residents were still alive, while a statistically significant number of the control group was not. So here we see that, in this case, transcendental meditation, but I believe all forms of meditation, are longevity techniques. They act on a number of different ways, both physiological, genetic, constitutional, to make the body live longer. We might even find someday that this, in fact, can increase maximum lifespan. Since we're talking about the brain at the moment, we also see that transcendental meditation has increased IQ levels in students over a period of two years. It increased the IQ levels. Nothing was thought to be able to increase the IQ levels. And we also see that with the TM technique, compared to controls, they had a number of measures, cognitive testing, and they show that it could actually increase intelligence. I think one way that it increases intelligence is by decreasing the level of cortisol, stress hormones. So we see that meditation has a number of different important anti-aging, physiological, brain longevity effects. So let me just take you quickly through, uh, we're not going to have time to actually do it, although maybe if you'd like to experience it later, we could do that. How many people have ever meditated? Okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. I guess about 30%. So, if you have, you remember perhaps that there are four basic requirements to eliciting the relaxation response in the most basic form. The first is comfort. But you don't want to be so comfortable that you fall asleep because the physiology of sleep and relaxation are two totally separate things. You can sit in a chair like this. You don't have to sit in a pretzel position on the floor either. You can sit in any way that's comfortable, in an easy chair, for example. Quiet. You don't want the phone on. You don't want the fax on. You don't want the dogs jumping all over you. If you're meditating with your spouse, that's fine. But otherwise, she doesn't bother you or he doesn't bother you. This is your time. It's silent time, it's your meditative time, and you have to have quiet. Comfort and quiet are the first two requirements. The third is a tool, and this tool can be any, and you should, if you're going to write this down, write the word any, circle it, draw arrows to it. Any thought, sound, short prayer that comes from your own philosophy or religion, or phrase that you want to use in the most basic form, you can use anything. Some Christians like to use the word, Jesus loves me, our Father who art in heaven, Hail Mary, full of grace. I had a patient who did a walking meditation doing Hail Mary, full of grace. Jewish people use shalom, or one. In the literature, it's recommended that you use the word one, if you cannot think of a word. It doesn't matter what word it is, peace, love, sky, blue, your daughter's name. It just should be something positive. You don't want to pick a word like alimony. <laughs> That's not going to be good. But you can pick any thought, sound, short prayer, or phrase in the basic type of meditation. And you stick with that. You use that over and over again. You relax all your muscles, follow your breathing. One. One. Now what's going to happen? This is the last part. Very important, the attitude. What's going to happen? If you've meditated, you know. What's going to happen when you try to quiet your mind? Is it going to want to quiet or get louder? More noise or less noise? How many, raise your hand if you think it's more noise. Absolutely right. You, the thing about meditation is I've had people say to me, I can't meditate, I'm terrible at it. Because as soon as I try to quiet my mind, thousand thoughts of the wink of an eye. I heard the other day that we have something like 250 trillion thoughts a day when you added up how many thoughts you have a minute times how many minutes of the day. And the key to meditation is this is where you, in this, especially in the beginning stages, this is where you get your energy. You're releasing the garbage from your subconscious mind. Pew, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. Why am I listening to this guy? I have so many things I should be doing. I need to balance my checkbook. I've got to wash the car. What happened to Bob? I wonder where Jerry is this afternoon. Where are we going for dinner? <laughs> Thousand thoughts of the wink of an eye. The attitude is, when these thoughts come in your mind, you simply say to yourself, okay, what's your name? Yeah, Lorianne. You simply say to yourself, oh well, Lorianne, 
relax, one. You favor your faith-rooted focus word. Or as a patient of mine said about three months ago, oh, you mean Dharma, you just start all over again? That's right, in my best Beatle accent. You just start all over again. You try to do it, relax, one, here come the words, da 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 You realize you're not on your word, you come back and start all over again. It's a loving attitude. You don't beat yourself up and say, geez, I'm terrible at this. That's not what it's about. It's just about getting into a nice, relaxed state and enjoying the effects of it throughout the day. So this is the basic form of relaxation or meditation. But what I'd like to do now is take you on to my latest research, which will culminate in the release of a new book in February of 01 called Meditation as Medicine. And this is the more advanced meditation which I'm doing some research on, which I call medical meditation. In that, we have still the four requirements, but we go on. We have breath. There are different breath techniques for different exercises, certain postures. Mantra is a sound, a different sound that you can use. Uh, for example, the five primal sounds, sa, ta, na, ma, very effective. It's called kirtan kriya, or a singing meditation. Uh, you may say, well, there's only four sounds there. There's actually five. The ah is common to all, so it's uh, t, n, m, ah. Uh, if you've ever heard of Wayne Dyer, he gives a number of lectures on PBS and throughout the world talking about the one primal sound, ah, meditating on ah and manifesting your destiny. The original undiluted technique are the five primal sounds, which I'm going to show you something in a minute, a research project about it. Sa, ta, na, ma. That can be an example of a mantra, but again, it can be any mantra. Mudra are fingertips, and in a moment you'll see why fingertip usage is so important in advanced meditation. And finally, the focus of concentration can be the chin, tip of the nose, root of the eyes, top of the head, or the meaning or vibration of the sound current that you're creating. It has a different physiological effect. I want to just take you through this research. This is the homunculus of the brain. You see that the fingertips are very highly represented in the brain the thumbs, the fingertips, the lips, the roof of the mouth, the tongue. Therefore, if you use your fingers, you're stimulating your motor sensory cortex. That's why using these techniques is so effective and much more powerful than regular meditation. There are 84 meridian points in the roof of the mouth. 84 meridian points. And when you stimulate through the use of sound current, the 84 meridian points, it sends a pulse to the hypothalamus and the pituitary to orchestrate positive secretions from these glandular structures. For example, sa is the back, ta, sa, ta, na, ma. Ma is the lips, sa, ta, na, back of the teeth, ma. Ma is the lips, that's very highly represented in the brain. Stimulates the 84 meridian points. Here's a study of a PET scan using a meditation technique. We see there's an increase in blood flow in the frontal and temporal lobe using the medical meditation. It's a much more targeted effect as opposed to the TM or basic meditation, which is a global effect. And you can see it's specific, as I said, since we're talking about the brain, here's the effect of a, uh, a medical meditation using the mantra Sat Nam, Wahe Guru, which is a more advanced mantra, on the hippocampus, and we see with the meditation, we increase the activity to the hippocampus and it stayed up afterwards. So this is much more targeted, much more specific. And so we've seen that it's basic, it can be more specific, and this is the more specific variety. Another effect of mind-body exercises, all the positive things that you want. Now I want to close by telling you that there's more to brain longevity, there's more to anti-aging than just living a long time. I mean, what are you going to be thinking about when you're 95 years old, getting another car? having another house, another relationship, making more money? No, that's not true. The studies have shown that when a person gets involved in an integrative brain longevity program, a holistic program, they develop a certain part of themselves, which is very important to quality of life issues and to anti-aging. There have been 250 scientific studies in the literature showing that when a person gets into that relaxed state on a regular basis, that they touch something inside themselves known as the spirit, known as their connection, known as their God, whatever it is. And they become more attuned to that. 
And there's also been studies that show that when a person has that genuine religiosity, their genuine spirituality, that their medical outcomes are markedly improved. For example, just to quote one, the Dartmouth study. They took patients who needed coronary artery bypass surgery, those who professed a genuine religiosity. They had a genuine belief. It's not like you hear me say it's good to be spiritual. And you say, okay, Carlson said it's good to be spiritual. I'm going to church on Sunday. That's not it. I mean, that might help. It's the idea of a genuine professional professing a, a heartfelt belief in your own connection to the soul within you, to the God within you and without you, who's everywhere, the formless being, the energy. When you have that connection, your medical outcomes are better, you have better health, less pain, less substance abuse, less depression, and it's showing that you actually have a longer life. So there's more to it than taking nutrients, hormones, and things like that. There's no real true longevity, no real true beauty, unless it comes from the inside. And it's all inside of us. We don't have to look outside of ourselves that much for it. It's all there within us. It's not an aspirin. It's not a drug. It's not something you can take when you get a headache. It's something that needs to be done on a regular basis. In the Orient or in India, they call this sadhana, or the regular practice. And they do this in the Amrit Vela, or the early hours of the morning, when the hormones are coming up. So my one suggestion would be to produce a brain longevity lifestyle for you and your patients, is to start your day in a positive way, what I call wake up to wellness. This will take you to that end point that we're all looking for, which is balance in our life, which is a long life, healthy, happy, more whole as a human being. And if we can do all that, then I believe it's possible that we'll fulfill our destiny and the purpose of life, which is to make the world a better place. So I've enjoyed being here. Thank you for coming. Have a great lunch and a great conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.